Uh, welcome, everyone, to the final plenary session of our second day of the World Stem Cell Summit. Uh, my name is Bernie Siegel. I'm the founder in, of the World Stem Cell Summit and executive director of the Genetics Policy Institute. Um, for those of you that attended the uh, Stem Cell Action Awards dinner last night, you were introduced to a wonderful community, the Huntington's Disease families uh, that uh, are so important uh, to uh, all of us who are at this meeting and all striving for the same thing to accelerate uh, the quest for cures. And if I can just share to the wider audience that's going to be looking at this <coughs> on the, on the uh, web, because we are, uh, we are, we're taping this and it will be rebroadcast uh, for the world. Uh, uh, one of the things that uh, stopped me in my tracks at the World Stem Cell Summit in Pasadena in 2011 was when I met uh, Francis and Judy uh, at the event uh, and in the hallway, it was in between sessions, and they stopped me and they said, you know, Bernie, thanks for, for bringing the World Stem Cell Summit here. We're big, big time stem cell advocates, advocates for the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine. And um, they proceeded to tell me the story of their families and the devastating disease of Huntington's disease. And as, uh, as most of us who are civilians, my background is law. I'm not a, uh, I'm, uh, not a uh, clinician. I'm, don't, I'm not a PhD scientist, but I'm interested in all of this. Uh, but we live in our own silos of the uh, afflictions that impact our lives and the lives of our loved ones, right? So uh, when I heard the Huntington story and uh, about the challenges of losing husbands and children and the devastation of this disease and being told that there's no hope, well, that's unacceptable, isn't it? Unacceptable to all of us that work in the field. So uh, I, we were moved and the, the awards committee of the Genetics Policy Institute did want to honor those leaders, these very strong leaders in the Huntington's community, the grassroots community, and the grassroots community and the patients are the underpinning of support for this entire field, whether it's industry or research, and are serve as an inspiration. And I've been told that it was the most moving, inspirational uh, presentations ever at any of our awards dinners. So it uh, meant a lot to the organizers of this uh, summit to create a, a plenary panel to bring in some of our best and brightest scientists, some of our advocates, and uh, the leader and president of the California Institute of Regenerative, for Regenerative Medicine, Randy, that, who has, uh, whose agency has funded millions and millions of dollars to finding uh, a cure and treatment for this uh, terrible affliction. So we are very, very pleased to present this panel. I'm very honored to present our moderator and chair of the session is Jan Nolta from uh, UC Davis, who has a, a wonderful lab, but uh, more than the lab and all of her scientific credentials that you can read uh, on your app uh, and in the program uh, is uh, Jan's heart and how she has uh, passionately fought for the community, not just looking at cells in a dish, but the human beings and families that are uh, fighting this affliction. So, Jan, thank you for chairing this session. Thank you. Pull it down a little, sorry. Thank you. It, it is such an honor to be here, and thank you all for being here to hear about this, because it's a disease that it's just easier to look away. I pretend like it's not happening, but thank you for not doing that and for being here and listening. This is um, a disease that has uh, captured my heart. My own lab works um, almost completely on Huntington's disease now after meeting amazing patient advocates, amazing Dr. Wheelock, amazing Judy Roberson, who's just coming in, and some of our um, patients, like Mike, who's in front right here, who's with us today. Um, it captures your heart and soul and engulfs you, and I hope that some of you will be inspired to help us in this fight against Huntington's and juvenile Huntington's disease. So we'll have um, four speakers today. We are going to um, start with the amazing uh, Dr. Randy Mills, who is the president and CEO of the um, 
California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, and we'll have him up to say a few words about the, what, what we think is the most amazing funding agency in history of stem cells. So, Randy, please. Thank you very much. Um, move this over here. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I'm not here, uh, interestingly, to speak specifically about Huntington's disease. Um, I'm here uh, to speak as an advocate on behalf of all patients that have significant unmet medical needs uh, and what CIRM is going to do about it and what CIRM is going to engage the remainder of the community to do about it. Uh, Huntington's disease happens to be a perfect example of an unmet, a serious unmet medical need that can be addressed with stem cell therapy. And when I uh, came to the agency in uh, about six months ago, uh, earlier this year, the pledge that I gave the board was, the good we're doing right now isn't good enough and we're gonna do everything we can to get better. And so that's what I'm gonna talk a little bit about today. Uh, what we can do to provide a, a little bit more hope and a little bit more progress towards finding cures for things, serious conditions like Huntington's disease. So um, the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine uh, was, uh, was actually established in 2004 through an amendment of the California Constitution called Proposition 71 which gave $3 billion of funding directed towards finding treatments for uh, diseases through the use of stem cell therapies. $3 billion is a tremendous amount of money. It makes us by far uh, the largest uh, funder of stem cell uh, research and development uh, anywhere in the world. We basically have five platforms uh, that we do this uh, through. One is education. We will fund everything from high school students through postdocs, training them in, uh, in the ways of stem cells. We do it through building infrastructure, uh, laboratory space, buildings, and, and, and the like. And then we have three, basically, product stages that we fund, discovery, translational, and clinical. Our mission, though, and this is, uh, I, I, will, I, I tell this every time I give a presentation anywhere, I will not give a presentation about CIRM where I don't talk about our mission. Because when you have $3 billion uh, to, uh, to dispense, you have a whole lot of people that would like a whole lot of money. And one of the things that, that I said we would always do is make sure we focus uh, on the patient and we never lose sight of the mission. Our mission is very simple and it is very clear. We are here to accelerate stem cell therapies to patients with unmet medical needs. If we are not doing something that addresses that mission at CIRM, we are not doing it anymore. Um, we are going to be highly focused and we're going to get this done in an efficient manner. If you look at uh, just how we've spent, so we've given out up to date uh, a total of 668 uh, awards and you can see across those areas and they range uh, anywhere from about 400 million up to about 500 million dollars depending on the various stages with, with, the, major with uh, the highest uh, per percentage of our funding going to clinical stage programs. I will, however, say this is a, a new trend uh, at CIRM. Uh, when, if you were to take a, a snapshot of this same graph uh, five years ago, you would see it would be more uh, disproportionately skewed towards the earlier stage things such as infrastructure and, uh, and education. That only makes sense, obviously, as stem cell therapies have moved along. Uh, further uh, down the development pathway, more and more resources are dedicated toward things like clinical trials. Specifically, what kinds of things we're funding. So we, we uh, have in, in, in our translational and clinical programs, we currently have 80 programs right now that cover 40 different uh, disease areas. Uh, and you can see um, actually our largest our largest single uh, therapeutic area of funding is neurological uh, disorders. Um, specifically with regards to Huntington's disease, we have uh, we've funded nine specific programs for Huntington's disease, totaling $32 million. When you look at 
who has gotten our money, um, this has been disproportionately the academic institutions. Again, this is probably skewed this way towards earlier stage research would be more likely to be conducted in academic research institutions. As we move things into clinical trials and closer to commercialization, we will see uh, more funding hopefully uh, being shifted toward, towards industry. Again, the goal here isn't to do great research. The goal here is to develop stem cell treatments that go on and help patients. I cannot be more clear about this. I don't want to just do good research. We're not the NIH. We have a horse in this game. Our mission is to get things done, not to just fund good science. With that in mind, um, we took a hard look at, uh, at the agency over the past few months and we looked internally and we said, what, what can we do? to uh, improve ourselves. What can we do in order to speed this process up and make it better and faster? And frankly, what can we do to make it more responsive to our mission? And that's where we developed this, what we now call CIRM 2.0. If you take a look at um, just sort of in a nutshell, the way we, the way we currently uh, do business at CIRM, uh, if you came to us and you said, hey, you know what? We have a great product and it's ready to go into a clinical trial and we want to do this clinical trial. Today, it would take us, on average, 22 months to get you funding for that program. Now, the problem is, we're an agency that's supposed to be accelerating the development of stem cell therapies, and we put in a 22-month hold. That's not okay. That's not okay. So we needed to take a close look at this. And we have different stages. We have application stage, which takes a long time because these application windows only appear periodically. We have the review process, which is, which you know, frankly, could be a little bit more streamlined. We batch them and we bulk them, and so they take a long time, five to seven months. Contracting takes forever, interestingly, because the steps before it take so long, and by the time we get to the contracting process, all the data you've given us is already outdated. So we have to do that all over again. So that takes another six months. Uh, and then lastly, administration. I, I, as my feeling is, up until now, we've been a little bit too hands off. Um, going forward, CIRM, not going to be a passive investor in this. CIRM is a partner in this. And so, as I said before, we don't want to just give you funding and hope it goes well. Our goal is to give you funding and then to do whatever it is we can do to make your program successful. That is what good looks like for us. Not, not coming up with an interesting finding, coming up with a treatment that actually helps patients. And so right now we have this process which takes 22 months. The great thing is, starting January 1st, we will replace that process with a better process. We will take that 22 month window down to 120 days. And uh, that's something that actually just got posted uh, I think about right now, um, <laughs> and so January 1st, that's going to that's gonna open up, and that's going to be part of one, one thing that CIRM's doing. Again, this isn't just about being faster, it's also about being better. I could, if we had more time, I'd go into a lot of detail and say, we're not just going to get programs through this process faster. The programs that are going to get through this process are going to be better. And so I'll end with this slide. Um, with CIRM 2.0, we're ready when the program is ready. So where it used to be, we would only have these uh, funding windows that would pop open sporadically. We are now open for business. If you have an idea for a product that could go into a clinical trial, we are here to fund you whenever that may be. Second thing is we're going to be a lot faster. That 22 months is going to 120 days. The third thing is once we give you funding, you and I, we're partners. And whatever we can do, if there's an issue with the FDA, we're going to be there with you. If you're having problems enrolling a clinical trial, we're going to find out some way to help. If you're having problems manufacturing, we're going to find one of our manufacturing experts, of which we have hundreds of, to come and help you do that. The bottom line is, with CIRM, we are here to make sure the stem cell therapies get to patients as quickly as they can. Thank you. Thank you, and it's so inspirational to have someone with your vast amount of experience in cell therapy and in business, because of course we need to take these therapies forward into businesses to get them to the largest number of patients. So I just need my glasses. <laughs> Thank you.
<laughs> the screens are very far away, and this one's very small, so thank you, Jerry. Okay. All right, so I'll be next. I'm going to talk about um, strategies for disease-modifying treatments in Huntington's disease, and that's what my lab works on uh, pretty much full-time these days. Uh, in my spare time, I'm uh, director for our institute and um, editor-in-chief for the amazing journal Stem Cells. So Huntington's disease is um, a fatal and terrible neurodegenerative disorder. It's caused by expanded CAG repeats. They cause a mutant Huntington protein. It causes a number of major problems in the cell, resulting in striatal neuron death, and a decrease in the level of brain-derived neurotrophic factor in the brain. The mutant protein acts back on transcription and stops uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor from being made. There's several strategies for disease-modifying treatment in HD. Um, neuroprotection, so a therapy that would delay onset or a slow progression. And so, for instance, the uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor therapy, about which I'll be speaking. And then cures. And these would be therapies that would prevent the mutant um, HTT protein from uh, killing the cells, from being made and killing the cells. And there are several um, strategies to do that on which um, our lab and others are working. The problem with all of those amazing strategies, with the gene editing using knockdown um, strategies, is how do we get these factors deep into the brain in the striatal neurons? That is really the rate limiting step. So there are AAV, or other vector delivery, that we could put directly into the uh, central nervous system, direct oligo injection into the CNS, and there are actually trials that will be starting in Canada and Europe testing this. We sure hope it works for the, for the sake of all of our patients and loved ones that have this disease. There are cell penetrating peptides and uh, methods to cross the blood brain barrier, which would be very um, exciting if those work. Labs are developing those. Since we are a stem cell gene therapy lab for the last 30 years, we're working on stem cell-based um, delivery methods. So we work on a type of adult stem cell called mesenchymal stem cells. And they uh, produce uh, microparticles, uh, nanotubules that are like hoses into other cells, and uh, uh, exosomes that can carry factors into the neurons. And so that's our strategy. We like to think of these MSCs as um, delivery trucks. They're adult stem cells from the marrow. They um, repair uh, damaged tissues by responding to the scene of the injury. They can migrate very quickly. They produce healing factors. We call them the paramedics of the body. And they have a strong safety profile in clinical trials, largely due to a lot of pioneering work that um, Dr. Mills' um, company, Osiris, did um, over the last decade. Very amazing work. So this is a video of the cells moving around. And if it gets started, um, you can see the cell-to-cell -cell communication that goes on between the cells. Oh. It worked uh, when we tested it, but there we go. So I'm not sure if I can point all the way over to that one, maybe. Yeah, yeah that's a good pointer. So right around in this area, if you focus in this, the cells are going to make a bridge, a um, tunneling nanotubule. This is like a hose that they actually open up into the other cell and they spill the contents of their cytoplasm into the other cell. We've been studying this for a number of years. They um, share things that are in their, in, in their cytoplasm that wouldn't normally be outside of the cell. They leave batches of little um, exosomes and microparticles that other cells then uh, come along and gobble up and the cell usually divides after it takes that because it gets an infusion of new batteries, uh, mitochondria, microRNA, 
new proteins, things that don't normally come outside of the cell. And there's a lot of cell-to-cell -cell interaction, and our lab actually has a um, transformative grant from the National Institutes of Health to study this um, type of interaction uh, between the cells, and it's um, endlessly fascinating to us. So since um, 1987, I have been in love with these cells. We used to call them marrow-stromal cells in the olden days. That still is MSC. And what I've been doing since um, I started um, in Don Kuhn's lab in 1987 is genetically engineering these cells and um, wrote a book on it. And these cells can make a huge amount of proteins or other factors. That was shocking, sorry. Uh, proteins or other factors for delivery to the cells. And so that's the strategy that we're using um, to make um, factors for Huntington's disease. We did publish um, a paper on this principle earlier. And this is our pipeline of the strategies. So on the right-hand side is the work about uh, the brain-derived neurotrophic factor delivery that is funded by CIRM and that we'll be discussing today. And then on the left is some um, work that's a little farther back in the pipeline that I'd like to just mention first. And we're working on these uh, strategies for juvenile Huntington's disease, which is very aggressive and needs to be treated very aggressively. It's very um, fast moving. It kills kids um, sometimes by six years old, and it's devastating. So we have done work to use the mesenchymal stem cells to actually transfer a RNA in inhibition, which normally would not be outside the cell, but transfer um, RNA inhibitory molecules to knock down that mutant RNA and protein. We can get over a 50% uh, reduction uh, just through this cell-to-cell -cell contact from the MSCs into the neurons. We have this approach um, patented and are going forward with it into in vivo studies now funded by um, philanthropy and by the NIH and by um, fellowship grant to our, uh, our postdoc in the lab, um, Kyle Fink, who's um, very incredible. This is the paper on that that was um, done initially by Scott Olson, who is another excellent postdoc in our group, and by our whole team. And now Kyle Fink and Peter Dang uh, have a collaboration in our lab for juvenile Huntington's disease. And this is between our lab and the Siegel Lab in the um, Genome Center at UC Davis. And this is to actually send factors, load, um, load the MSCs with factors that would then go into the neuron that's at risk. And they can actually excise the extra CAG repeats to make it a normal length. And this is incredible work that these um, young men are doing and was just presented at the Society for Neuroscience. So I wanted to show you a little bit more about this cell-to-cell -cell, um, contact and interaction because it's very key to the things that we're doing. So the MSCs really are very social. It's like their Facebook and Twitter. They like to um, interact with each other and uh, communicate, communicate with one another. This is a, um, a video that I'll show you next where the mesenchymal stem cells are in green and there's a uh, at-risk neuron carrying the uh, Huntington's mutation and making the Huntington's protein in red, which is a little difficult to see in here. But you'll see the uh, mesenchymal stem cell come down and actually start infusing factors into that um, neuron. So the next video, if we can start it please. Great. So you see the neuron going along here. The MSCs are in green. This MSC touches it and runs away. We don't know why. And now this good guy comes along and decides to help and starts infusing factors directly into that neuron and actually chasing it to try to help it. And so we need to understand in the lab which MSCs are just uh, repulsed by this problem in this neuron and which ones really want to come in and help. And we're studying the basis of those interactions. So we manufacture these MSCs to produce the factors to help the damaged neurons and other cells. We harvest a normal bone marrow from a healthy donor. We grow the MSCs um, in our, uh, following standard operating procedures in our good manufacturing practice facility at UC Davis. 
We then um, we engineer them to produce extra uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor that I'll discuss uh, next, or the RNA inhibition uh, or gene modification that I just uh, mentioned, the gene editing. And then we safely freeze them away until we have a, a patient to treat. And we're doing a number of studies with them. As I mentioned earlier, and I'll just briefly mention again, uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor is a lead candidate for uh, Huntington's treatment. It plummets to very low levels early on in Huntington's disease. It's needed to maintain neuronal connections with each other and to cause new neurons to be born in the brain. And there have been animal studies that show that uh, replacing the BDNF in HD mouse models will cause a new uh, striatal neurogenesis, and this is what we're very excited about. And so I've mentioned a lot of things about MSCs, but basically they're our, our lead candidate for delivery of the brain-derived neurotrophic factor because we can just make them into these little um, in vivo bioreactors. We can uh, put them into the brain and they will just pump out this factor. So our current studies are doing a number of studies um, to look at the, the safety and the efficacy of this proposed product. This is our pivotal BDNF lentiviral vector. You're not expected to look at that. It's just a very pretty map. <laughs> and our vector core makes these at UC Davis. We can get great uh, BDNF production from the mesenchymal stem cells that have been engineered to uh, produce the, the brain-derived neurotrophic factor. We test them in Huntington's disease and juvenile Huntington's disease uh, mouse models. And so we have mice that are the YAK128 strain. That is a model of um, adult HD. And then um, we have the R62 strain that has early onset and seizures and is a model of um, juvenile Huntington's disease. And we um, inject ourselves into the brain, into the, striatal, the striatum of the mice, and then look to see if it uh, improves behavior and motor function. So this is showing the green MSCs in the brains of the uh, animals. Again, a little larger. And so each, um, each MSC will make like a halo of uh, BDNF around it. And we're hoping that we can get enough coverage uh, from the number of cells that we inject to um, get good um, delivery of the brain-derived neurotrophic factor in the human brain. And we do have non-human primate models um, to test this as well. We're looking at retention and safety of human MSC BDNF, which is our, our uh, development candidate. In the mice over time to see how long the cells will stay in the brain using the in vivo imaging system in these uh, mice. And that's looking at live mice. You can see through their skulls using this type of camera and see that the cells are being retained. And then we have very detailed uh, striatal imaging that is going on. And um, Haley Nelson, who's a, uh, a wonderful technician in our group, is doing these studies. And the next one is a video um, looking through the brain with our um, amazing uh, imaging department at UC Davis, if it works. Going through and looking at the volume of the striatum, which is the, um, the leading thing that gets preserved. That's our, our main um, goal, is to preserve these uh, striatal structures. And so we're using this technology to do the um, imaging. And as Dr. Wheelock will discuss next, that is what we do uh, with the patients as well, is look at uh, the in vivo imaging. OK. These are a number of um, graphs showing that the human uh, MSC engineered to express BDNF um, attenuates the motor dysfunction that the uh, animals get. And basically on this, the, um, the red line is the uh, transgenic animals, and they don't do very well in our motor tests. The um, blue line is wild-type animals, and the green line is our animals that have been treated with the MSE BDNF, and they're almost back to wild-type. And um, have, um, as you can see on the bottom, have um, better gains in function. They also have um, 
better metabolic activity and a striatal volume after treatment with our MSC BDNF, as shown in the green bar. So in summary for those efficacy studies, um, our initial data in conjunction with previous reports um, done by Gary, our collaborator Gary Dunbar's lab, uh, indicate that human MSC BDNF implanted directly in the brain can uh, prevent motor symptoms and um, brain cell loss in our mouse models of uh, Huntington's disease and juvenile Huntington's disease. So our ongoing studies are pivotal efficacy and dose finding studies that we're doing now, uh, funded by CIRM. We are so grateful for that. We'll do pivotal safety studies next. And then our pre-cell study is currently enrolling, and Dr. Uh, Vicki Wheelock is going to tell us about that. I have just a couple more slides first. Um, our goal, like CIRM's, is to take these therapies from the lab to the patient. We have an incredible team that um, likes each other, we love working together, it's great, we meet every week, and um, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to do that. We're manufacturing the cells in our UC Davis Good Manufacturing Practice Facility, which is um, directed by Professor uh, Gerhard Bauer, very busy facility. And this takes teamwork, this takes donors, scientists, physicians, staff members, foundations, community members, patient advocates, uh, patients in trials, and really the most uh, amazing funding agency ever, CIRM, because where else would we have the chance to be doing this? And so I thank everybody, and especially our patients in trial. We have one hero here with us today, Mike, and thank you, Mike. <laughs> we'll be hearing about that. And this is awesome. This takes a lot of teamwork and um, Oh, sorry, that last slide was a lot of teamwork, and these are our, the number of our people that are actually working on this team in our Institute for Regenerative Cures. So thank you so much. This is our international team, amazing number of collaborators, amazing number of people who are involved in getting this trial to help um, our patients. And I'm next going to introduce the amazing uh, Dr. Vicki Wheelock, who is the uh, physician who will be delivering these therapies to the patients and is one of the most amazing colleagues that I've ever had the good fortune to meet in my life. So, Vicki. Thank you, Jan, and I want to um, again thank Bernie and thank the committee for allowing us to come and present the status of our very exciting research. So I'm going to back up a little bit and talk a little bit about Huntington's disease, um, bring it back up from the cell to the patients. Huntington's disease is a disease of families. First and foremost, it's a disease of families. When we're treating patients with Huntington's, we're treating one individual, sometimes multiple individuals, but we're treating the entire family. And even though it's a rare disease, it touches so many lives. So there are only 30,000 people with Huntington's disease estimated to be in the United States, but for every person with HD, there are an estimated five people at risk of developing Huntington's disease and countless family members who are caregivers. We believe that Huntington's disease cost $2.5 billion per year, 30,000 patients. But when you look at the lost wages and you look at the care costs and the caregiving costs, it's an enormous cost, an enormous burden to families. And of course, because it passes from generation to generation, it makes it ever worse. Um, there's a picture here of a family that we know very well um, whose daughter has Huntington's disease. You can see her being held in her mother's arms there. She has the juvenile form of Huntington's. And of course, for her to have this disease, it means that her parent is affected also. So it does capture our hearts and goes straight to our hearts. We've got to help because we are losing the battle. The Huntington's disease gene was discovered 21 years ago, back in 1993. And I remember back then how we thought, oh, there'll be a cure around the corner. There's the gene. Where's the cure? We're still not there. The mutation is a very direct, simple mutation. It's, it's an expansion in one copy of the Huntington's gene. Each person has two copies of each gene for each trait, and all it takes is for one of them to have a CAG triplet expansion to cause a mutant protein to form. 
And unlike many neurodegenerative diseases, Huntington's disease strikes in midlife. It doesn't strike the elderly like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's commonly do. It strikes in midlife. And you can see from this graph, it strikes in childhood. And yes, sometimes it strikes late in life. And it passes from generation to generation. Each child in a family with Huntington's disease has a 50-50 chance of inheriting the gene and developing the symptoms later in life. So the types of brain degeneration that we see in Huntington's disease are almost too numerous to, to enumerate. Huntington's used to be called Huntington's chorea, and it's known for causing choreic involuntary movements. That's part of it, but together with the movements is a progressive loss of the control of voluntary motors. So people can't tap their fingers, they can't hold things, they can't push down on the gas pedal, they can't fasten their buttons, and it gets worse and worse over time. The chorea is replaced by stiffness and rigidity and loss of control. But even worse are the cognitive and behavioral changes. The lack of impulse control, the anger, the difficulty with being creative and coming up with new, new ideas and new solutions, the psychiatric symptoms of depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, psychosis, too numerous to list. This is a lethal combination that causes untold suffering for the patients and the, for the families with Huntington's disease. I've circled there the striatum. Although this mutation is present in every cell of the body, it's only selectively affecting certain populations of cells, primarily the cells in the striatum, in the deep nucleus of the brain that controls movement and behavior and cognition. And those cells die out, and we can measure them using neuroimaging studies. There's a progressive loss of the striatal volume. At the time of diagnosis of Huntington's, patients have already lost 50% of these cells before they even have symptoms. And then after the deep structures are affected, there's an inexorable worsening of the cell loss on the outer surface of the brain. You can see in the lower image here with the red areas and the yellow areas showing progressive loss of brain cells. So where are we with Huntington's disease 21 years after finding the gene? One thing I can tell you is that we have the most amazing advocates of any disease community. I'm convinced of that. So the patients, the families, we have HDSA. We have programs to support. We have government benefit programs. We have patients and families who are coming to meetings like this to express their support, to raise funds, to help to inspire us to do this work and to work as hard as we can. There's one drug that's ever been approved for Huntington's that helps the chorea. Don't get me wrong, we love that drug. It's great that we have it. That's all we have. Everything else that we do is palliative care. And at this point, even with all the government and pharmaceutical companies that are increasingly being interested in helping to find treatments for Huntington's, we have yet to develop one treatment that can delay the onset or slow the progression and keep people in the early stages longer. We, we would take that. Even if we could get that, we would take that. So back to CIRM. When CIRM was started back after the voter initiative in 2004 to, to uh, award grants, Dr. Nolta came to UC Davis. We recruited her to be our stem cell director. And before she even came, I had a meeting with her, and I ran to her, and I said, help. You've got to help us. You've got to help the families. And one of her first translational grants from CIRM was, in fact, to work on engineering the mesenchymal stem cells to deliver a therapy. She had the brilliant idea of using these amazing cells as a treatment for Huntington's. Back in 2010, we were invited by CIRM to give a spotlight on Huntington's disease. It was held at our state capital in Sacramento, and we were able to describe, just as we are today, the clinical symptoms of Huntington's disease, the promise of stem cells, but most importantly, we had the advocates. Judy Roberson, who's pictured there, talk to CIRM about the impact of this disease on her family. And Sherry, who's standing there, is at 50% risk of developing Huntington's, and she talked about what that experience is like for as long as she can remember growing up knowing that this might be her fate. As you now know, we had a great deal of celebration in July 2012. We were invited to submit a grant, a planning grant, to develop a stem cell treatment for Huntington's disease. Uh, we were one of the lucky teams that was invited to do that. We were thrilled 
to share with the patients and families and advocates who were there on the day that the uh, grant was funded by the, OC, by the ICOC to develop a trial that would go from preclinical all the way into a phase one trial in human patients, first ever. So the goal of our trial is to develop a phase one safety and tolerability trial of engineered mesenchymal stem cells to deliver BDNF as a neuroprotective therapy. This is not a cure. If this works as well as we hope it does, it will help to keep people in the early stages a little longer and to give them more time while we're still working on those more definitive treatments that will help to downregulate the gene and help to rescue our patients. So the project plan for this grant as we developed it, a four-year grant, very ambitious. The first two years are to finish all of the uh, uh, studies in the transgenic Huntington's mouse model. Let me stop here to say that we're very fortunate in Huntington's disease, not only do we know the gene, we can take that gene from the human and put it into a mouse and give a very powerful form of a model to model the treatments for Huntington's disease, and that's what we're doing. But we decided that we weren't just going to sit on our hands during the time that we were waiting for that important work to get done. We decided to do a lead-in study, which we call pre-cell, where we're recruiting people who have early stage Huntington's who might be interested in participating in the stem cell trial to come in and to allow us to check with them every six months and do intensive measurements of disease progression. We get a baseline. We look at their motor function, cognitive function, behavior, mood, quality of life, brain imaging, we do blood uh, tests, we collect spinal fluid. Spinal fluid we take out of the lumbar area, bathes the brain so we can measure vital chemicals within the spinal fluid to look at the rate of change so that when we're ready to go forward in HD cell, we'll already have a group of patients who have been characterized that we know a great deal about to help enhance our ability to tell is it safe. The most important thing we're doing with our HD cell study is it's safe to go forward. That's what we need to know about. So we have two clinical trials. Pre-cell is going on right now. This is an observational study. No treatment is being given. We are doing intensive measurements. The intended planned, future planned stem cell trial we're calling HD cell. It will be the first cellular therapy treatment in Huntington's disease. We hope. We have to get all the way there. Um, and so right now we've enrolled a group of people, um, who, and we're still enrolling people who would like to be considered for going forward into HD cell. Here are the um, inclusion criteria. Oh, I'm sorry, here's the team. Sorry, I'm reading it, the, the slide from far away. We have assembled an international team of experts who are thrilled to be working with us. We have a neuropsychologist who's the best on the planet in Huntington's disease at Monash University in Australia. We have um, people who are working at Mass General Hospital, Seattle Children's Hospital, a number of international collaborators who helped us write and design the grant. And we're working with this multidisciplinary team because it takes a huge team to do all this work and make sure that we're doing the best science that we possibly can. Pre-cell is a study where people come in, we take their blood pressure, we take their blood, we give them lots of tests to do, uh, we videotape their motor exams, we do brain scans, we do all sorts of tests, and we repeat this every six months. And the inclusion criteria I wanted to include, there are only six for inclusion, there are lots of exclusions, but the six inclusion criteria are, first of all, adults. As terrible as JHD is, juvenile Huntington's, we've decided that a novel treatment like this should be tested first in adults. Ethically, that's the right thing to do. So we're only testing this in adults. Do we want to have treatment for children? Absolutely. But let us get our foot in the door with adults first. They have to have been diagnosed already with Huntington's. There are people who've tested for the gene, know they have the gene expansion, we feel that the risk-benefit ratio for this study would not be right to include them. We're doing this only in people who have Huntington's, but they're in the early stages. They're still, many of them are still working, they're still very independent at home. We know that if our treatment's going to help them, we can't go too late in the disease. They have to have definite clinical signs of Huntington's, and they have to have a caregiver or a partner or informant who consents to be in the study with them, who can give us feedback about how they're doing. 
And we're also asking them to avoid pregnancy during both studies, especially because of HD cell, because the cells, the stem cells that are gene modified that we put into the brains of patients, we don't intend ever to expose a fetus to those. So we ask a lot of the people who are in the study. Uh, this is an update. So far, we have screened 30 patients, enrolled 24 patients. Uh, we have several more who are lined up now to be enrolled in the study. Um, we're doing the detailed examinations. We're starting now to look at how the patients are doing and to mine the data that we're collecting. And one of the first things that we did was to look at the cognitive performance on computer-based tests and on paper-based tests to make sure that we had validity, that we're recruiting people who have early stage Huntington's. We looked at a couple of other databases of, uh, that researchers have developed to make sure that we're definitely targeting the right population. And we found that our population of people in pre-cell are exactly the same as those who are identified as having early stage Huntington's in other larger studies. We're also starting now to look at the imaging data that we're collecting. We're doing very, very high-powered MRI imaging, and we're using the IDEA lab at UC Davis to analyze those images. And I can show you there's a um, series of brain scans here. The scan that's in black and white is sort of a template MRI scan uh, of an older individual. The colored scan that's in green and red, the one right next to it, is comparing our patients in pre-cell uh, as a group to people who are older, normal aging individuals. And you can see right away the blue areas are the areas where the cells are already gone. Even at baseline, even coming into this study at early stage, they already have a lot of cell death. The red areas in this study are the areas where they have more brain cells than the older person. Why? Because they're younger. People with Huntington's are younger than people with Alzheimer's disease or normal aging patients. And we can see these very specific, very strong signal. Our imaging lab people are amazed at the degree of change that we can see even in early stage Huntington's. We've now been looking in a small number of individuals at six months data, and it turns out even over a short period of six months' time, we can detect further cell loss. This has not been reported before, and this is going to be a very important finding for going forward to safety when we go forward to the HD cell trial, and we're looking at these volumes to make sure that the treatment isn't hurting anyone. We need to know what the rate of change is before treatment. We're working with an amazing team at Mass General. I think they are the world planetary experts on biomarkers for Huntington's disease. That's the Steve Hirsch lab. And they will be doing measurements of BDNF in the blood and in the spinal fluid in the patients who are in our study. They're also going to be doing some exploratory measures, looking at measuring the mutant Huntington protein. This is using something called enhanced chemoluminescence to measure the folded, misfolded protein in the blood and in the spinal fluid so that we can see what rate this is accumulating and we can see if there's a change after our treatment. So going forward, we're planning to continue pre-cell. We're enrolling. We're measuring people every six months. We have tons and tons of data to analyze. Um, we're continuing uh, to meet weekly with the, with the lab, with Dr. Nolte's lab, to find out the pro progress. Everyone wants to know, how are the mice doing? You know what? The studies are blinded. They're done with scientific rigor. We don't know how they're doing because the blind hasn't been broken yet. That's what we're all waiting to see. And we're preparing to go forward to uh, present a package to the I for an IND with the FDA. We hope that we'll secure that IND in early 2015 and start bringing our uh, treatment into patients later in the year, about a year from now. That's what we're hoping. So this is what HD cell will look like. I call this a triple threat study. How are we getting those cells into the patients? They won't get into the brain through the intravenous route. We're going to have to put them right in the brain using brain surgery. So we're doing stem cells, gene therapy, and brain surgery. But I do want to reassure you, the brain surgery that we're doing is a relatively mild, common brain surgery. In fact, we're using the same technique we use for deep brain stimulator implantation. The patients will be awake, like this gentleman in this picture. It's not painful. It doesn't hurt. And we will be targeting the areas in red. Where are those red areas? There we go. That's where we're going to be putting the cells, right into the striatum, those, those special cells that are making BDNF. And we hope that they will both 
help the survival of the sick cells that are there that haven't died yet, and also to recruit some new re uh, regenerating cells, which we know that BDNF has been proven to do. Um, I do want to point out over 100,000 patients worldwide have had deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's. We're not going out there too far. We're doing something that's very uh, standard in treating neurological diseases. Now, we care a great deal about ethics. Part of what we wrote into our grant is to make sure that we're conducting this study in, with the highest regard to ethics. Um, we're studying how our patients and how our participants are doing in the study. We're, we have a bioethicist who's a core member of our team who comes to every single patient uh, discussion meeting where we're talking about whether people are appropriate to come into the study and if there's any issues from an ethical viewpoint that we should be thinking about. We present we presented our research about this at the American Society of Humanities and Bioethics in October, and we had a captive, uh, why do I say captive? We had a voluntary audience, but they were, they were just uh, sitting on the edges of their chairs hearing about this and came up to us afterwards to talk to us about this. We also have a survey that's out on SurveyMonkey. If you go to the HDSA website, you can find it, and the study, uh, the survey is to survey people with Huntington's people at risk of developing Huntington's and their caregivers, just the HD community to ask them about their beliefs, attitudes, and concerns about potential participation in a study such as this one. We need to hear from the community. We've always learned from the community. We've always been inspired. We need to continue to listen to them throughout the course of this study. So I want to end with a thank you. I want to thank our advocates. I want to thank Judy Roberson, who is standing there with Jan Nolta. Uh, they were presenting um, uh, their um, passionate work in getting this study launched. This was back in 2009 at the Huntington's Disease National Clinical Research Symposium. Judy was an invited speaker. Jan was an invited speaker. And then there's a glamour shot of Katie Jackson, who's also been an important and instrumental person as a supporter and as a spouse, as someone who's been really inspiring us and helping us to move forward with our mission. So that's my last slide. I want to thank all of you. And I think I'm going to turn it over now to Katie. All right. Yeah, it is far away from back here, huh? Okay. Let's see. Is it going to go? It's getting your slides. Okay. All right. Hmm. Okay. So there it is. Why am I a patient advocate? Well, that's the reason right there. That's my husband and my three children. My husband has been diagnosed positive with Huntington's disease, and my three babies. Um, are at risk of Huntington's disease and juvenile Huntington's disease, so I fight for uh, I fight for them. Um, I'm vice president of Help for HD International. We're a nonprofit serving the Huntington's disease community. Uh, these are some of our programs. I just am going to talk a little bit about some of them. One is um, Help for HD International Radio, the HD View. We launched in 2010, and we go live every week for one hour. Each show is well thought out and, and really scripted to make sure all the important information reaches our, uh, our listeners. To date, we have 89,000 listenership and 195 archive shows that are available on iTunes. We have had interviews from everything from science to care to advocates to support services covering all topics like clinical trials, research, resources, caregiving, and many other topics. Um, we also have a show, Ask, Ask Dr. Goodman, who is an HD expert every month that goes live so the Huntington's community can call and ask an XD, um, HD expert any questions. Uh, we have the Huntington's Post. Um, it's an online newspaper that brings inform informative reporting to our community. We have Speak Inspired. I am, if anyone knows me, I am huge in social networking, so we decided to create our own. So that's ours. Uh, JHD.org uh, is our newest program and one that is very dear to my heart. It's a website that focuses 100% on children that are suffering with Huntington's disease, juvenile Huntington's disease. Uh, people can go and read about the JHD research initiative and they can directly donate to that research um, and cut out all middlemen. All that money goes directly to uh, juvenile Huntington's research, which I am throwing my first walk on June 6th, which I am very excited about, and all money will go to juvenile Huntington's research. Uh, we have support groups, 
people go and uh, they're able to be with their community members. We use Vimeo, we have Issue for a magazine, we use SoundClouds for PSAs that we let people know about clinical trials. We have a patient registry where people can go and say if they want to be a part of um, clinical trials and we contact them and let them know um, how to contact the clinical trial uh, sites. We're HIPAA certified and that's a really um, effective program that we've launched. Uh, we have Research for HD, which is where people can, uh, from the community can go and directly donate to research or institution, which is really nice. We cut out all the middlemen and we make sure that all money donated goes ex uh, to the research. Okay, so the power of the patient advocate's voice. Um, as a patient advocate, we use our voice to tell our stories of living with chronic illness and injury. Who better to tell these stories than the people living with chronic illness every day? For people to really understand the import importance of research, they have to understand how important it is to the people who are suffering um, and need treatments and therapies. Not everyone understands science. Actually, very little people do, obviously not in this conference, but in, in the big world. But what people do understand is public interest stories. When people hear about devastation and terminal illness, um, they, you know, they will truly understand why research um, is important. Who would, have, who would have ever understood the importance and urgency of finding a vaccination for the polio virus if they hadn't seen the, the catastrophe and devastation that this vir virus brought? Uh, we use our voices to explain to the public the potential that regenerative medicine holds. For a disease like Huntington's disease where there is no therapy, no hope, no cure, the potential that regenerative medicine holds for us um, is, is, is great for our community. We need to educate the public and break down the stigmas about the stem cell field. I think this is best done by patient advocates. Uh, we need to petition for new initiatives uh, to the public and to government representatives. Uh, we have an amazing thing in California called the California Stem Cell uh, Agency. And being a Californian myself, I'm proud that, uh, to say that I was one that ran out to vote yes for Prop 71. And being a taxpayer, I can't even imagine a better place for my tax money to go. I thank Bob Klein and all the patient advocates that hit the streets and got signatures uh, to bring the California Stem Cell Agency to us. Uh, we use our voice to encourage new research in science, and we use our stories to appeal to regulatory. Okay, so this is kind of just a chart showing uh, the many hats that we play uh, as supportive roles as patient advocates. We support first and foremost the patients and the disease communities. We support new treatments and ther therapies to come to market from discovery. We support the science from the very beginning. We educate our community about the science. We fundraise seeding money in the beginning. We do anything we can to support science. We play a role with regulatory, always respecting and keeping in mind FDA and IRB guidelines. Which brings me to my clinical trial support platform that we have at uh, Health for HD International. My husband has now enrolled in his fifth clinical trial. Uh, my husband and I know how important it is to enroll and retain clinical trials. We support those efforts. Once a new drug goes to market, um, uh, it's, uh, we, we support um, all the clinical phases through industry by educating our community about the investigational therapies. The patient advocate's role in helping advance the stem cell field. Um, we educate the public about the importance of regenerative medicine. We educate the community about the importance of clinical trial enrollment. We have to create a strong clinical trial support platform. We've done that at Health for HD International. It's kind of been my baby. Uh, everything from patient uh, registry to PSAs to caregiver support to a TAC plan talked about with patients and caregivers to make clinical trial process as comfortable as possible for the patient and the caregiver. We talk about clinical trial investigational to the actual investigational sites. Um, about ways to support the patients and caregivers throughout the whole process. We believe this will help with clinical trial retention. Uh, we raise money and awareness for science. We donate biologicals to further um, research. In this picture here, you see Marie. This is her, um, on her birthday, actually donating skin cells her, um, to help advance HD science. Um, Marie died, actually, uh, unfortunately passed away eight months after that picture was taken. Um, we support the community through clinical tri the trial process, um, which I spoke about earlier, and we support industry and institution throughout all phases of clinical trials. Uh, 
participation in regenerative medicine for our community imparts hope. What role do we play as patient advocates in bringing new treatments to market? Uh, we, first and foremost, I know I keep talking about this, but it's enrolling clinical trials. We have to educate and empower the community about the importance of enrolling and retaining clinical trials. Typically, no, people know very little about clinical trial, the clinical trial process. We have to implement the importance of enrollment and retention um, to, help, to help break down, um, and also let them know about it to break down fears and anxiety about enrolling in clinical trials. We have to educate our community about the FDA and how they need good, solid data to prove safety, tolerability, and efficacy. We have to retain and complete clinical trials to satisfy the FDA requirements. When the FDA reviews data, and if they have any questions from patients or caregivers, we need to show up and speak up to their concerns and answer all their vital questions. I have done this on uh, several occasions, actually, where I've been uh, contacted by a pharmaceutical company um, to explain to the FDA about um, a specific symptom associated with Huntington's disease and how it affects the quality of life to help them understand. They get so sick. Um, this is what this horrific disease does to our loved ones. Look at Margie, Marie, Michael, and Billy. Once healthy, beautiful, ready to take on the world, Huntington's disease took every chance away from them of that. Huntington's disease took away their chance of living any, any, full, any type of full life. But it's not just that. What Huntington's disease promises is years of pain and suffering. It promises a loss of all quality of life. They lose so much weight, skin, bones, choking, chorea, dystonia, dementia, hallucinations, psychosis, loss of ability to walk, loss of ability to talk, cognitive loss, psychiatric behaviors, feeding tubes. It literally destroys every bit of their quality of life. This fate has to change. Marie, Margie, and Billy have already lost their battle with Huntington's disease. Michael um, is in his final stages. We know the hope to change this horrific fate lies in research. A historic day for Huntington's disease. Uh, this is the day, in one of my mind, in my mind, the most significant day that will go down in the Huntington's disease history books. 2012, 30 patient advocates marched into Burlingame ICOC meeting to speak out about the importance of Dr. Wheelock's clinical trial for our HD community. That day, Dr. Wheelock's project scored number one by the CIRM Scientific Review Board. Looking up at that screen at that meeting and seeing Huntington's disease on the top of the list next to the number one, it literally brought tears to my eyes. I am so thankful for the tremendous amount of work and dedication put into this project by the HD teams at UC Davis. When the last yes was said by the ICO bo ICOC board and literally confetti flew in the air, as you can see in that picture, Dr. Wheelock's project was funded, $19 million to carry us through phase one for the first in the world groundbreaking historic trial for the first potential therapy for Huntington's disease, funded. My HD community is so grateful to CIRM for funding this trial and giving us a chance and giving us hope. I'm almost done. I like to talk a lot. Okay. I don't, I don't know if I'm going to be asked back, so I'm going to cover everything. Okay, um, so time is ticking for many of our precious children. All of these children in this slide are at risk of Huntington's disease. Time is simply something we do not have. We need to act now to start to change, start the change for the next generation. We need to fight for them. We also have a juvenile form of Huntington's disease. All of those children are at risk of juvenile Huntington's disease. More progressive, more cruel than adult onset, if that's even imaginable. Juvenile not only have the same symptoms, but they also suffer from grand mal seizures, tremors, and tremendous pain. It is devastating what these children are having to endure. All of these ch children are at risk of JHD. We need to fight for them. I believe that regenerative medicine holds the key to save these, saving these children and so many other children from pain and suffering.
that they will, dur that they will have to endure if something does not change. This is my final slide. Life isn't about waiting for the storm to pass. It's learning to dance in the rain. My husband, like I said, is now enrolled in his fifth clinical trial. We know that we will never see this promising science come to market if we don't take part and participate in clinical trials. I have to say that I, we have never been more excited about enrolling in a clinical trial like we were to enroll in pre-cell. There wasn't even any question from my husband. He was so excited and he couldn't wait to sign up. A stem cell trial for Huntington's disease, amazing. Thank you, to, thank you again to CERN for funding it. We can't thank you guys enough. And thanks to the HD lab and the HD clinic at UC Davis. You are the perfect storm. And because of you, my Huntington's disease community is dancing in the rain with hope. We hold tight to that hope to be the last generation to live with Huntington's disease the way our generation and past generations have been forced to. Um, just real quick, this is my Help for HD International executive team. They are an amazing group of people. I love them. Um, the logos are national and international partnering organizations that we work very close to. Um, and then I would like to also just give a shout out to Frances Saldana, my sister, my in advocacy, and um, what we've been able to accomplish together has been great, and um, it's been a good good journey so far, and we have a long way to go. And then my mother of advocacy, Judy Roberson. I would not be standing here in front of you if it wasn't for Judy, so you guys can blame her at the end of this meeting for this long talk. And, um, and uh, so thank you to all of them. Thanks. I can't possibly say anything to follow that up. Just thank you for coming. Thank you for learning about this. Thank you for not looking away. And if you have any questions, we'll be up here. And last of all, thank you to CERM. <laughs>